So integrate uh, uh, experiments into a satellite and, and then operate it. Uh, as payload, uh, we are not going into a lot of these optical uh, scientific uh, payloads because size matters also for us. But we are doing more in the uh, signals uh, and radio, radio, so software to write fine radios and some sort of things that are here in SIS for us as well. Uh, if you look at the history, we define that there are three different waves going on at the moment. We have the first wave, which has been going on for quite a while, where we have universities and different companies trying to, to actually just put something in the sky, see how a nanosatellite would actually work. And here they normally use the amateur service bands for that reason. Then uh, the next step is actually to demonstrate what can you use these satellites for. So you try to do some demonstrations of payloads and missions, and then we are entering into a kind of a gray zone where you know is it amateur bands or is it more other service bands you should do. And the next way that will come very shortly is the third way, where actually people will depend on their missions also from uh, nanosatellites. So uh, we don't see that nanosatellite is just toys. This is something that will be operational <coughs> and that actually I would say life will depend on uh, in the future. So that's where we are going at the moment. Uh, just to show some of the examples of the missions we have uh, trying to demonstrate is uh, especially the COMICS-1, uh, which uh, was to demonstrate the ability to intercept or monitor the signals from aircrafts, the ATSB signals, uh, with this uh, helix antenna. And we have an USF uh, signal or system for the download. That was launched in November 2013 and is still in operation as a satellite. Uh, I will show you a picture of some of the results. So all the top here is uh, positioned from the aircraft, so you can see the corridor from, uh, from Europe to US. You can also see how busy Moscow is, and also how heavy traffic there are actually in, in the Far East. Uh, as a day, we are also uh, very interested in uh, what's going on in, in the Arctic area, and we also see that there's a lot of activity from different countries going on in the Arctic area, going back and forth. So that was one of the missions we've been doing. The next one we're doing is uh, Comics 3, which we're doing in cooperation with ESA. <laughs> it's also ATSB where we're having our second generation payload on. Uh, we also now have an expand transmitter. That's actually the same one as all one has presented from Silent. Uh, we are going to uh, assist the uh, NEST with uh, installing their expand uh, earth station in Corona. So that's what that, that is for. And then we have an L-band receiver as well. It's uh, our software-defined radio uh, that will actually look upwards to look at the uh, geo satellites and see what kind of uh, transmissions they are doing uh, in the L-band. This is uh, going to be launched here in, in June, and it's going to be deployed in September 2015 as part of the campaign where the first Danish Osnab is going to the ISS station. Uh, so we are going to be quite proud of that. Someone noticed that uh, I missed out number two. We were on the Antares uh, mission. Uh, that actually had a deorbit device, so maybe it was too effective. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, sometimes, you know, you can be lucky anyway, because NanoRack and uh, NASA has actually located the box where our satellite was, so they found the deployer, and uh, we were actually just last week received our satellite again from uh, that mission. And then it doesn't have to scratch at all. It's in total good shape. We are still, we have not turned it on yet. We need to do some testing before we are 
uh, and setting up some equipment before we are sending it on. But uh, I'll get you posted up how it goes. Uh, but it is actually safe in our facilities at the moment. Okay. If we are looking at some of the uh, communication systems that we're doing, we are doing VSF and USF radios. We have our first uh, generation where we have a fixed uh, frequency uh, as a dot half duplex USF radio is running in FM deep modulation. But the next generation that we actually have uh, released already is a, a digital uh, receiver for USF and VHF, and uh, they are where you can actually change the frequency of the system as well. And it is quite sensitive, so it uh, actually will handle also a poor uh, link budget as well. Uh, the next thing that uh, I'm going to present is uh, our new software defined radio, which is actually currently in production. Uh, it's a standard 10 by 10 uh, centimeters uh, uh, device, just following one, one stack unit. It's based on two systems it has an SDR platform and it has an, a front end or uh, yeah, front end receiver board. Uh, the SDR itself is in Silex 7000, which is used for many, many SDR platforms. It's a quite uh, heavy machinery that can run uh, several communication links in, in parallel. Uh, one good thing is that if you have a lot, enough money, you can actually also buy uh, convert or software tools that you can actually program this in MATLAB. <laughs> and get the DHDL code uh, converted for you. So it actually makes a platform where you can say, you know, don't need to be an FPGA programmer to actually make experiments and make uh, analysis with this kind of tool. Uh, so the RF is a dual band receiver going from 70 megahertz to 6, 6, 6 megahertz. And the only additional thing you need is to add on these uh, different antennas for the different bands, uh, and then you're actually ready to go to do spectrum analysis, radios, etc. You can also actually implement Wi-Fi for it. Not in the ISM band, but you can use it in the <coughs> not frequency, but you can act, actually use Wi-Fi as a protocol as well. Um, the thing comes uh, with uh, a full uh, qualification program, and it will actually <coughs> fly here in September. So, what's the space for that one? Uh, going for the future, the things that we are looking at in Denmark is, you know, we have a very big area in the Arctic, and uh, and uh, we are looking in, you know, how can we assist on, you know, monitoring that kind of area. Uh, so there are several missions that you can define, but we are looking into. Eight or ten satellites in the, in the constellations, probably six or twelve few satellites that will be in operation, and that will give a more situational awareness of you know what is going on in the different areas, but also work as a communication system. Yeah, I think I will continue. So, some of the uh, communication systems that we are looking into the future, I agree that there has to be several communication systems on board uh, in, in the future, there will be a low secure uh, system for the TTNC because we need to have something that is om omnidirectional that works in the early uh, mission time and then you will have more high speed data transmissions for that are more directional antennas but that has high speed both, both up <coughs> and down link and also into satellite link we are going to work on that so the object, objectives of all of that is to actually to make a real-time communication system for between satellites and different ground stations. The last slide is that you know we we see a tendency that uh, the requirements for the bandwidth and also the uh, uh, is is increasing. There's no limit for how much we can have. Uh, we have seen that the frequency allocation process is uh, limiting for the market success for us. But uh, you know, as we will be watching uh, ITU and see how, how things are working. 
but we are quite happy with uh, the statements from ITU made these days. But I think also the community could learn from the terrestrial world that you know there are some things that you know if you need to deal with congestions and interference, the only way is actually to standardize some of the communication systems that we have to handle interference much better. And the uh, Crumbspace is willing to also participate in that kind of work. I think, thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Excellent. And I see very bright future of small satellites. All this project from the coffee break are really dream, dreams. Very nice. Thank you. And the last gentleman is going to speak to us about something which is quite far. Because uh, Michael Johnson is going to speak about deep space CubeSat, which was up to now, even for Norbert's dreams. If Norbert, Norbert is listening to me, not listening. Norbert, Norbert, this is even more as your dream. Here now, the presentation will be related to deep space CubeSat, and even not a CubeSat that you are not able to see it mostly. Michael is going to present to us a project which he developed in the spacecraft com where he's CEO. He founded also the crowdfunded CubeSat of Kickstarter with Cornell University, <coughs> runs interplanetary CubeSat workshops. That's why you are like a CubeSat radio astronomer or something, interplanetary CubeSat, Stinfin, etc., etc. Uh, you can start to speak. I, I, I load your presentation. Okay. If I have the PowerPoint version of it. I think I gave it to this one. I think it's in the direction of the other. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Michael Johnson. I'm uh, from representing Pocket Spacecraft today. Uh, we're a stray, very strange <coughs> organization, I'm going to admit that. This whole presentation is going to be a bit weird, but that's okay. Um, Pocket Spacecraft is a project from JA. JA is a nonprofit. Uh, we have operations in China, the Isle of Man, the UK, and the US. And what we do is we create, we encourage, we fund nonprofit space exploration and also commercial space exploration. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to do open source projects to make space as accessible to anyone as possible. Uh, we have seven flight projects at the moment, and we collaborate with basically anyone who's interested. And we have about 300 volunteers working in about 30 countries on various aspects of our project, and we also pay some people as well. So a few years ago, I set myself a task. So I'm, I'm new to the space business. I've been in here for about five years. And I said, before I retire, can I send something to orbit or land everybody in the solar system? So I realize that sounds nuts, it's not a problem. We have a fair amount of wriggle room in that, so what exactly is everybody in the solar system? So your graphic there is 88 of the largest bodies in the solar system. If we stick with the definition of the sort of more than 5,000 kilometers, you're looking at 10. If we're going to include sort of everything over half a kilometer in the asteroid belt, we're looking at a million. But for the purposes of thinking about how you might do this, a million's a nice round number. So how would you launch a million spacecraft? So the idea we came up with was this concept of a pocket spacecraft. So a pocket spacecraft is something that anyone can afford and work out how to use, how to launch, how to operate. And we want to try and kickstart the personal space age. Just like when main, the transition from mainframes to personal computers, it was when it went uh, became accessible to private individuals, that's when computing really took off. And you could argue that with CubeSats, we're in that transition. Um, maybe the CubeSats are the mini computers of the world and the big spacecraft are the mainframes and you know, the next step of the pocket spacecraft are the personal computers. But we'll see, see what we can do. Now, the important thing is that we have to do this properly. So we need to do this responsibly. We're not just doing this for fun. Um, we want to work with the community. So. When I've done sort of pitches to NASA, you know, grant applications for NASA, I've been one of, say, 600 proposals in the call. 
and at the end, maybe six or ten will be selected. Now, those 500 proposals that weren't selected aren't rubbish. They just weren't quite good enough.